Okay, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, to those who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, for those who are sticking around, thank you so much. So Musa, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, really looking forward to this conversation. I think maybe the first thing I'd ask you is, what is, what is diversity training? Where does it come from? Why is this thing so so popular today? Where, where, what is this phenomenon all about? So, I mean, if you already had Frank Dobbin on, I don't want to be too redundant. He's really like fantastic. Okay, but um, but one thing that I'll say is, but but to like briefly overview, uh, there are some early versions of diversity training. Um, uh, like um, there was the formation of what was called T groups and the development of like sensitivity training that actually goes all the way back to the late 1940s um, and uh, started to build up, um, became more popular in the uh, mid to late 60s. The first like um, firm that was created to uh, to do diversity training was called Pacific Management Systems. It was created in 1967 by a gentleman named Price Cobb. Um, uh, but but really, um, the impetus, uh, but diversity training didn't really take off. Didn't really become a, a huge deal until the mid 80s to the early 90s, when you really started seeing this huge expansion in diversity training. And the reason you saw this expansion was a few reasons. So one, one reason is uh, starting in the late 70s through the early 80s, universities started enrolling a lot more women and minorities, um, people from middle and lower class backgrounds uh, as a result of changes in the law, um, as a result of um, changing university, um, changing funding structures and things like this. So you had much more diverse group of people going into college and then they would graduate college. <laughs> they, were going, they wanted jobs, of course. Um, and so they were entered. So you had this much more diverse cohort of people entering the workforce. Um, uh, and, um, and so a lot of employers found themselves with a much more heterogeneous labor pool all of a sudden. Um, and so they had to face for the first time in many cases, um, some of the challenges that come with the benefits of diversity, right? Um, so you had people with divergent backgrounds, divergent perspectives, divergent life experiences, working side by side for, for common goals. Um, and at first there were huge blowups, there was a lot of lawsuits, there was a lot of turnover. Um, and so, um, and then layered on top of these kind of pressing organizational challenges that companies were dealing with um, for, with respect to productivity and things like this and, and retainment, there were changes in the law um, that, that um, so, you know, there was uh, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, there were executive orders like um, affirmative action, there were Supreme Court rulings like Adams v. Richardson that finally formally desegregated colleges in 1973. Um, and, uh, and so there were all these new workplace, um, these new rules and regulations that companies had to comply with as well. And a lot of the laws that were passed were actually kind of vague, like it wasn't clear uh, what it meant to comply um, with the rules. Um, and so you had the development, and this is when you really started seeing the proliferation of HR professionals as well, who were, um, doing that, like figuring out what does it mean <laughs> to, to put these, um, these uh, requirements that were like, what does that mean in practice, right? Uh, and so as they're trying to sort through these, this more diverse workforce and comply with these new rules and regulations, um, a lot of companies reached for, um, for this training that had been developed um, that, that purported to be able to help groups, help people from different backgrounds collaborate together and overcome their differences and things like this. Um, the problem was there wasn't a lot of research on whether or not, uh, whether or not that training was effective because it, and it hadn't been most of this, most of these training programs, they had, they had been, you know, um, pretty experimental carried out kind of small scale. And all of a sudden they were put in all sorts of companies nationwide at a huge scale um, in very in like practical settings, not in like you know in small groups or um, in, in controlled experiments, things like this. Uh, and so, it was widely implemented starting in the late uh, '80s, uh, mid '80s, and early '90s. And then over the decades that followed, though, um, it started to become increasingly obvious that some of the problems that the training was supposed to solve didn't seem like they were being solved. There was still a lot of conflict. There was still a lot of turnover. A lot of um, organizations were still not diverse. There were still lawsuits. There were still bad PR happening and things like this. And so um, uh, researchers started asking themselves, like in becoming a lot more um, empirically oriented to figuring out, well, does this stuff 
actually work. Uh, and, the, and the picture that emerged from, um, from that research uh, program uh, hasn't been pretty <laughs> in many respects. Uh, but, but so that's, that's the big picture about sort of uh, how we got here. And, 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 uh, and as far as what the training is supposed to do, I'll add um, one problem with diversity training as it's currently practiced is that uh, it's not always clear what the training is supposed to be doing, like what concrete goals, because there are kind of a lot of goals that, the, that companies are hoping to achieve through the training. Um, so for instance, they wanna make sure they're complying with affirmative action and equal opportunity laws and to demonstrate their compliance in court if needed. Uh, they wanna um, protect themselves from lawsuits. They wanna improve productivity and cooperation within teams. They want to um, signal to employers and uh, employees and prospective employees that they're an institution that cares and is committed to doing something about different social justice problems. They want to signal to customers the same kind of thing that they're an organization that cares and is committed to, you know, um, they want to hire and retain a more diverse staff at various levels of the organizations and for a bunch of different reasons that they want diversity in their staff um, as well. Um, and it's not even clear in, in many cases, um, um, companies don't do a good job of explaining why they want diversity either. Um, but but there's a bunch of goals that they have for why they want diversity um, as well, uh, both as a legal compliance issue, as a PR issue, as for companies and prospective employees to enhance productivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this whole list. Um, there's like a broad range of things that companies are trying to uh, accomplish with this tool. And uh, they're often not very clear or explicit about which specific thing, and there, there's not a lot of tailoring that's happening. Like, this is the goal um, that we have. This is a specific concrete goal. The training is gonna help us achieve this goal in this specific way. Like, there's not a tight relationship between the, um, the means and the ends because the ends themselves are not clear. It's kind of a, an all-purpose scattershot tool that's used to try, to try to advance all of these goals at the same time. And it often ends up um, advancing none of them. <laughs> Um, particularly effectively. Yeah.